Greetings, beloved. Thank you for tuning in today. It is the dream of many people to purchase homes. While many people choose to purchase a home that is already built, others may choose to build from the ground up. Either way, the builder is required to use a blueprint. A blueprint is defined as a design or a plan put on paper for the purpose of constructing a building successfully. The same way construction workers follow the blueprint in order to successfully build a house, likewise, Christians who want to build a solid family must be willing to follow God's blueprint to do so. Stay tuned as we discuss the design that God has given us to follow, God's blueprint for family. Everyone, and we thank you all for joining us today for more of God's Blueprint for Family. My name is Brother Hawk Bolden, and of course, I'm sitting on the side of my lovely wife, Sister Antoinette Bolden, and we are here again to bring the word of the Lord to you. And we, of course, thank God for this opportunity uh, to be able to come to you and share uh, what God has given us concerning family. And we want everyone to know, of course, that the things that we share uh, come from the wisdom of the Lord. Uh, these things may not be understood by everyone, um, but um, it's important that we, we get to a point as Christians that we just accept God's wisdom and God's word concerning family. And I think oftentimes uh, people, they live their lives a certain, certain way, uh, and throughout their lives they see certain things, they see certain patterns, and they just by habit take on all of these different things, you know, by observation or whatever the case is. And so that seems to be the blueprint that they use is, you know, what their family, what they saw growing up and all of these things. And they may have seen uh, what they think was a successful marriage because of the amount of years that a couple was together in their family or whatever the case is. And, and so they deem that to be the, to be the norm, uh, you know, but, of course, the only thing that counts is what God says about marriage and what God says about family. And uh, that's what we're here to talk about is God's blueprint for family and the way that he does things and the way that he operates. And it's important that when we submit ourselves to God, when we uh, get saved and we turn, we accept that salvation and we turn our lives over to the Lord and we submit to him, you know, submit to his lordship, uh, that should be a, of every area of our lives. Now, oftentimes, uh, we, we try to exclude God from our family life because we think that we know how to do it better than he did it, or we think we know better than him, or maybe we just don't have enough sense to know that we're supposed to follow God's word when it comes to the structure of the family and how to uh, abide in the confines that God has set for the family unit. And so my prayers is that when people um, give their lives over to the Lord, that they will also give everything over to him. You see, because that's really the only way you can serve him anyway. Oftentimes, though, we compartmentalize the Lord. You know, well, I'll let you be Lord over, over me in this area, but not in that area. And uh, when that's the case, then, of course, he's not the Lord over anything. He'll just let you go on about your business, and the whole while you'll be thinking that he's leading you and he's not you see and so we just have to be careful in those things and so we're here uh to talk about god's blueprint for family and uh because there is a blueprint that he has established and all throughout uh his word he talks about the families of the earth and of course you know what when god uh created the universe he had family in mind we see that he was family oriented from Adam and Eve, when he created them and he told them to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, uh, that was him establishing the family, you see. Now, here's one of the things we have to know, of course, about family, is that, you know, you talk about being fruitful and multiplying, and a fruit will only produce seed after, it, after its own kind, you see. In other words, a, a banana tree uh, or, you know, uh, tomatoes or apples, they only produce seeds after their own kind. Mm -hmm. And so if you're, if you're an apple, then that's what your seed is going to be. And so when that seed is planted, 
you know, you take that seed out of the apple, then what do you expect to come up but another apple tree, you see? And oftentimes, parents think, well, I, I can be a apple tree, but my children, they'll be, I'll help them to grow up to be bananas. No, that's not how it happened. Or, uh, sometimes parents uh, <coughs> see apple trees in their children and, and blame it on something else besides them being apples themselves. You see, you got that term, bad apple. <laughs> and so uh, we just have to be uh, real with those types of things, that our children are a direct reflection of us. You see, they are a direct reflection of us. Mm -hmm. we have to, we, and we have to know that we're going to see some good traits, and if we're not careful and we're not living according to God's word, we'll see some bad traits. And so in that, as parents, we have to curb that. We, first of all, ourselves have to line up with God's word when it comes to, uh, you know, these different things. We have to ourselves line up with God's word. We're, you know, we can't expect our, to, to curb that rebellion in children when we ourselves are rebellious and when we don't like authority. Of course, your children are not going to like your authority uh, and, and will grow up hating authority if if they see that you know if if it's in you that you don't like authority can't nobody tell you nothing so what kind of children do you think you're going to raise you're going to raise some children that are stubborn just as stubborn as you are you see and so here we're again we're, we're uh, on this topic of guarding your family and things that we can do to guard our families amen a week before last uh the lord had us to talk about uh, of course guarding our family uh, and we, we were talking about house cleaning. Mm -hmm. You see, in other words, going through your house, making sure, uh, in other words, there are some things that may be uh, in your home that's not pleasing to God. It may be some movies. It may be some books. It may be some games or some video games. It may be music. And so we're talking about, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about house cleaning. And then last week uh, in the series of Guarding Your Family, uh, we talked about generational curses, things that we as uh, parents can do to open up those things for generational curses to come in. And we looked at the four generations of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob uh, begat the 12 tribes of Israel, his 12 sons. And we see in that uh, that all four of those generations had something in common that Abraham had introduced into their family, and that was deception. Of course, in the 20th chapter of Genesis, we read about Abraham uh, going into this land and telling his wife, look, tell the people you're my sister so that they don't kill me because you're a beautiful woman, and so nobody killed me over you. And then we see that in Isaac. He does the same thing with the exact same king that Abraham did it with. And then we see with Jacob how he deceived Isaac uh, when it was time to receive a blessing by pretending to be Esau. And then we see, of course, with, the, with Jacob's sons, how they deceived their father uh, by basically <coughs> selling Joseph and telling their, their father that uh, he had died, you know, that some animal had killed him. <coughs> and so Excuse that me. spirit of deception was introduced into that family by Abraham, and it carried over, just like the word says in the book of Deuteronomy, even to the third and the fourth generation, where God said, I will visit the sins of the fathers uh, on, up on the children, even to the third and fourth generations. And of course, as we explained, that wasn't talking about God making the third and fourth generation pay for what the fathers did. It's talking about that that spirit, uh, whatever spirit was introduced into that family, it'll be there and it'll stay there. That's why you have, uh, as we explained before, you have sons who watch their fathers grow up watching their fathers being drunkards and hate the idea, you know, being fearful of their father for not knowing what he's going to do, uh, being a drunkard, and then they'll grow up and be the same drunkard that their daddy was mm -hmm. because that spirit is there, you see. And so at the end of that, we talked about how, of course, to uh, break those generational curses. And so this week uh, with, with um, guarding your family, we're going to talk about uh, people, Allowing people in your family, whether it's actually somebody that's kin to you uh, or someone that's uh, maybe just staying with you, uh, making sure that things are straight 
with your family. And, and the idea, of course, is just, you know, making sure that um, no spirit is introduced into that thing, you see. And so we have to be careful with that. Amen. Amen. So <laughs> if you have your Bibles, let's go to the seventh chapter of the book of Joshua. And, and we're going to read on that uh, about basically the accursed thing. We're going to do some studying on that. We're going to see what God's word says about it. I tell you, one of the biggest problems that I think is in, uh, one of the biggest problems I think that we see in the, in the church today is their, um, uh, the, their look, the way that they look at sin. In other words, uh, sin has become something that is, is acceptable. You see, and because of that, uh, God's face is turned towards people, against people, according to the word of God. You see, <clears throat> people become people have become relaxed with sin. And I think I want to say it's in the book of I, uh, in the book of Amos, uh, where the Lord speaks to him and says, woe to them that are at ease in Zion. What does he mean when he say that those people who who are just relaxed, who think, hey, uh, God excuses sin. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God or. Whatever, and so the Bible says that they are at ease in Zion. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not judging themselves. They're not looking at their life and thinking, you know what? God wants to clean me up from this sin. Mm -hmm. And so, since people become desensitized to sin, and they, you know, of course, the Bible calls it having your conscience seared with a hot iron because you've been playing with sin for so long, God judges people and they don't even know that they're being judged. You see? And, and so even, even in the church today, we see that, you know, where people will find every excuse for sin. You know, people will find excuses to sin. And they, you know, well, I'm not perfect or nobody's perfect. The Bible don't say that. Or God understands I'm only human. And all of these other excuses that the devil give them to, to excuse sin. Mm -hmm. You see, now, again, we don't know what else to preach but the Bible. And, you know. David, uh, it was said in the 119th number of Psalms that thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. You know, Jesus told the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, he asked her, well, where are your accusers? And she said, there are none. He said, neither do I accuse you. He said, but go, go, neither do I condemn thee, but go and sin no more. Hmm. He didn't say, well, you're going to fall sometimes, but when you fall, just repent and that'll be good. He told her to go and sin no more. And then the man that he healed that time, uh, he told him, uh, um, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon thee. You see? And so in that point, Jesus was acknowledging the fact that this thing that have come upon you, it was because of sin. So don't, don't you go out there playing with sin anymore so nothing worse right. come upon you. Mm -hmm. And we have a whole generation of church folks today that make excuses for, for sin because Preachers will not preach against it, and you know, and so they accept it as, well, I'm human, or you know, nobody can be without sin. And the Bible don't say that. There's nowhere in the Bible that says that, you see. That's and right. we just have to tell the truth about it. And and so then we wonder why our family unit is coming apart, why so many families and homes are broken up, mm -hmm. why husband and wife don't know how to be married and know how to love one another. We wonder why the children are just running around like mad dogs or whatever, you know. Why they're rebellious is because you're rebellious as a parent. When that Bible says go and sin no more, uh, it means that. When it says that you can live without sin, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound, God forbid? Mm -hmm. It means that, you see. Mm -hmm. And so ain't no use in us uh, wondering where's the victory, you know, in this Christian walk. If we haven't first of all realized that we should have victory over sin, right. you see. And so this is one of the things that we're going to look at is uh, in, in the seventh chapter of the book of Joshua. Mm -hmm. as, as what God thinks <clears throat> about these things that we don't judge among ourselves. These things that we don't check. In other words, that we're not looking at to say, you know what, I don't think God would be pleased with this. Let's move this out of the way. Let's get this. Mm -hmm. out of our home and let's get this from among us I don't you know so we're going to look at this story and see and, and just to set it up of course the children of Israel they have come out of Egypt 
and Moses have already uh, died and have been buried by the Lord. And so here uh, we see that the children of Israel are pretty much on their last leg. They, they're about to conquer the last few pieces of land in the land of Canaan that they're supposed to conquer. And from, this, uh, from the time they came up out of Egypt until now, they have had victory after victory, and they haven't lost a, a war yet. They haven't lost a battle yet. But here, something different happens, and so we're going to see what happens here. So we're going to start reading at uh, verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Now this, uh, this is after they went into uh, Jericho. Uh, this is after they went into the city of Jericho. And the Lord had told them in the sixth chapter, do not take of the accursed thing. Do not, you know, don't take of, of these things that, that are accursed by me. Don't take of those things. Okay, go ahead and keep reading. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth Aven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. And so here, they're supposed to go to Ai, and in Joshua's mind, we, we've overtook uh, Jericho. That was an easy battle. God gave us that city. And uh, sure enough, he's going to give us Ai. And God is with us. And we're not going to even send our whole army. We're just send two or 3,000 men. Don't be there long. Just go in there, take care of your business, and come on out of there. Don't even labor there that long. Okay, go ahead and keep reading. So there went up thither of the people about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. That means that they lost hope. Mm -hmm. What in the world happened here? We didn't even send our whole army because we were just so sure that we were going to win. This, they're not that big of a city. Jericho was much bigger than they were. Jericho was a fortified city that had a wall around it. And we were able to defeat them. So the Bible says that their heart melted. The people melted. The hearts of the people melted and became as water. In other words, they just, they just could not understand. They, were, they just didn't understand. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead and keep reading. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the even tied he and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. Uh oh, now let me tell you what's going on here and then let me relate this to what goes on today. They're basically uh, disappointed at what have happened. Mm -hmm. And they're thinking, well, maybe we went too far. Mm -hmm. We wish, did, and they're questioning God. God, did you bring us over here to be defeated? Not looking at the idea that God had already given them the battle at Jericho. Right. You see? And so they get to this battle and they lose. 36 men lose their lives. Well, none of them lost their life at, at these other battles, you see? And so they're not understanding what's going on. And their natural... Um, response to this is, is God's fault, number one. Maybe mm -hmm. you, you, you're you the one that set us up for this loss. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side of that, we should have been content and just dwelt on the other side of Jordan and we'd have been cool. And let me tell you something. There are so many Christians who are in this very situation right now. Mm -hmm. they, they, they're losing a battle on in the family, you know, uh, things are going on that they feel like they have been defeated about and all of these things. And instead of them examining themselves, right. they blame God. Maybe God just, you know, he set us up or maybe I, and, or they'll say, well, I've overstepped my bounds. Let me get back in my comfort zone and just, you know, 
uh, just accept good enough, in other words. This was good enough, so let me just stay here. Mm -hmm. No, God intends for us to make new ground, but to do that, we have to check ourselves, you see. We have to, we have to check ourselves, examine ourselves by the word, because God's word doesn't lie. God's word, he meant for them to inherit all of the land of Canaan, all of the promised mm -hmm. land. Just like he intended for you to have the promises that he has given you in the Bible. Mm -hmm. But when those promises aren't being fulfilled, don't look at God and act like God's hand is short. It's not God, it's you somewhere. Right. There's a breach, you see. And that's the way it is in our family. We have to guard our family. And part of guarding our families means we have to look at ourselves and examine ourselves to see where a breach may be, you know. All right, let's go ahead and keep reading. Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ around us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will thou do unto thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? All right. Let's see what's going on here. There's a big pity party going on. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Uh, God's not into pity parties. You know, <laughs> the devil is. Pity parties keep people from having victory. If you throw in a pity party, it's because you lack faith and you're not being, uh, you're not aware of what's really going on. Pity parties is for people that don't know God and for people that don't claim the victory in God. Mm -hmm. There's no way in this world you should be a believer and having pity parties because if you believe in God, God don't do pity parties because he's never defeated. And so if we are if we are his children, then how are we defeated? Why are we throwing pity parties except we don't believe his word or except something's going wrong? There are some issues there that we're not addressing. And so let's see what happens in, in verse nine. You know, uh, Joshua, basically, they're still having this pity party. And so in verse 10, we see what God thinks about pity party. He tells them to get up. Why are you lying on your face? In other words, quit that whining and crying and let me address what's really going on. Since y'all mm -hmm. won't examine yourselves, let me tell you what's going on. All right, verse 11. Israel has sinned and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing and have also stolen and disassembled also and they have put it even among their own stuff. Now, he's talking about the whole camp of Israel. That's the reason why they went into that battle and they lost. Mm. Because of their sin. And the reason why people lose the, the battles in their families. And, and, you know, people aren't guarding their families like they're supposed to. is because of sin. You have to guard your family against sin. All right, let's go ahead and keep reading. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy the accursed from among you. This is, this is for you people that make excuses for sin. You don't have God to, to fight your battles for you when you got some accursed, when you got sin among you. Mm -hmm. There are churches today that are ineffective. There are families today that are defeated, that God is not with, because you won't deal with sin. Now, let's, mm -hmm. let's just bring this to what we're talking about today. You know, a, a lot of times uh, families will excuse things. Mm -hmm. I've seen parents excuse things from their children. Right. Well, you know, they, they're teenagers. They've gone through their rebellious years. Where is that in, in the Bible? Where does it say that... Teenagers just automatically get to a certain age and they're supposed to be rebellious. <laughs> That's not in the Bible. But this society have mm -hmm. accepted that. Mm -hmm. No, we don't That's accept true. talking back and all that other stuff. You know, you can't, you can't live under this roof and talk back, you see. You, you have to set children straight. You cannot think, and, and, and bless their hearts, I know so many, I know parents who just go right along with that foolishness. You know, you know, in other words, I, I think a lot of times, and what I mean, a lot of times, parents will even try to live vicariously through their children. Let them go to parties. Not, we're not talking about godly parties. You see what I mean? 
these things, why would parents allow children to go to these ungodly functions? You see what I mean? And, and, and then wonder why when the child come home, they're full of the devil and don't want to listen to you. It's because you letting them partake in things of the world. As Christian parents, <clears throat> you need to be, you need to set rules. I, you know, to us as parents, it doesn't matter what every other child is doing and what their parents are allowing their children to do. We, we have a standard that we, we set for our children that you have to live by. And if you can't live by that, then you need to get somewhere else to live. And that's pretty much the way it is, you see. But unfortunately, you got parents, they just go along with it. Well, I went to parties when I was, when I was growing up. You know, now we're talking about ungodly stuff. I did it when I was growing up. So what, what, here's my question. Were you saved when you were doing it? Okay, if you weren't, then why? Why do you allow your children to do it? And you now, now you're supposed to be saved. You're supposed to have more sense than your children have. You see, and, and let me ask you, you know what you were doing at those parties? You know you weren't speaking in tongues there, you see? <laughs> so, you know, we say, well, that's, that's old-fashioned. Well, you know, God is old-fashioned, and his word, he doesn't change, mm -hmm. you see? Now, he talks about stuff like that, carousing and what the Bible calls revelry. That's partying, and, and parents will allow their children to go to these parties and you have no idea what these children are doing. And then you wonder why when your child get old, older and grown, they're in the club every weekend. Because you started them off clubbing when they were little, going to all these little parties that they go to. You see? Our children can't hang with children that's not saved and that's not living for the Lord. You, you see, if we're trying to raise them up in the admonition of the Lord, you have to guard your family. The Bible says that and it's what we just read here in the, 11th, uh, in the seventh chapter of Joshua, that Israel have taken up the accursed thing. What was Jericho was a worldly city. They weren't serving God. Mm -hmm. And so what this is a picture of is when believers partake of worldly things and still think that God is going to be with them. And, and what we just read here, mm -hmm. uh, verse, read verse 12 again. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies. You see that? And what is God saying? When you partake in things of this world and, and, and you're not guarding your family and, and you're silly and you're allowing your children to partake of the things of this world, you will not be able to stand before your enemy either. You will be defeated because God will not help you live in sin. That's right. Now, his word is clear. You see? And so that's something that we have to that we have to know. Go ahead and keep reading. Verse twelve. But turn their backs before.